Well, good morning and welcome to today's webinar uh, with Zien Group and City Forum and the FS Club. We're here today to talk about a, quite a somber subject, long wars and forever wars. And we've assembled a, an interesting cast of characters. Uh, interesting because when Mark and I were discussing this, we weren't too sure how we wanted to handle it. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But before, uh, before I do so, uh, if I could, I'd like to hand over to Mark uh, for a welcome. Mark, over to you. So very briefly, Michael, thank you very much for uh, helping us again. City Forum works in the area of intelligent defense and smart power uh, with a series of, um, sort of forums and studies every year. We've done it five times with considerable help from people in the uh, sort of MOD and with assistance from BAE Systems, which has provided us with uh, sort of kindly unconditional support over uh, the, the whole sort of period of this project. Michael periodically comes in with a thought about a discussion which would be useful for our event. And when he suggested the idea of working uh, with Jasper Ford on this occasion, I thought this is absolutely brilliant. The first City Forum event ever, which um, came at the time of the Adam Smith Bicentenary, which I had the pleasure of hosting, involved a discussion that uh, included a, a former British Prime Minister, a German Chancellor who very recently left office, the actual American Republican vice presidential candidate, and the novelist Doris Lessing. She pointed out, this is years ago, Saddam Hussein and Iraq as a problem. The political figures all dismissed what she had to say and why she had to say it, but it was an absolutely brilliant contribution on that occasion. I've never forgotten it. I'm delighted that we we we, we have Jasper with us um, uh, to, to, to today. Uh, sort of, uh, Madeline and Jeremy have have um, uh, helped me enormously over the years, and and, and I'm delighted that uh, uh, they're part of the discussion. And uh, so, so, Michael, you're a, a a polymath of the kind that, that we love to see. You're going to be an exciting Lord Mayor, and we wish you the well and congratulate you on that appointment. I th think that um, I should now sort of shut up and let the discussion uh, con continue. Delighted uh, to, to, to have everybody here for what, what is the prelude to our intelligent defense and smart power work um, uh, th this year. We were criticized last year for dismissing the, the, the security and defense review uh, uh, pr produced by this country as uh, inaccurate we thought in very many ways, and we think so it's turned out. Uh, but and we're now looking at what might be sort of done instead. Today's discussion is excellent. Michael, thank you for running it. Well, thank you, Mark, for that introduction. Uh, and as we move the slides along, uh, I think you all know me, Michael Minelli, but I'd like to focus on the next slide and thank our many, many sponsors who, who made it. Um, Jasper, there's, there is a bit of a weight on your shoulders today to live up to Doris Lessing, I think. Um, this, uh, this idea of Germany with the, uh, the Ukrainian author by the name of Andrei Kirchhoff. Andrei Kirchhoff uh, wrote a book uh, called Death and the Penguin, which is a wonderfully surreal, uh, rather, rather reminiscent of Mikhail Bulgakov uh, and Master and Margarita in some ways. Uh, but he brought out a book in 2020 called Grey Bees, which is about the life of a beekeeper in the then Donbass region and how the war was affecting him. And I recalled that uh, Jasper had in fact written in his books the idea that the Korean War had never ended. And that's what inspired today. And I think it was delightful that then Mark immediately said, well, Jeremy and Madeline are, are the natural people uh, to, to field that off and provide the deeper expertise. So we're going to have a wide ranging conversation. Now, the agenda today, for those of you in the audience, is fairly straightforward. Uh, I'm going to get it out of the way in one minute. Uh, and at 11.05, we will have opening remarks. Each of our panelists, uh, Madeline, Jeremy, and Jasper, will talk for approximately three to four minutes on th their thoughts. Then we have three questions that we would like to have the panel discussion. But during the course of all this, please do send in your comments, questions, observations into the chat room here on the GoToWebinar series, and I will field them uh, into the conversation in a, in a rolling way. 
uh, please do use the chat room facility because I'm here with you. I'm not on Signal. I'm not on WeChat. I am not taking emails. I'm focusing on this today. Uh, all of your comments and questions will be sent to all of the panelists uh, with your email attached. If you want to get in touch with somebody or something, just say that's what you want, wish, and we'll make sure that that is passed on to them. The session is being recorded, and if you like it, it should be up in approximately two days, and you can share it with friends and colleagues and family, watch it with some popcorn over the weekend. So uh, with no further ado, if I may, I'd like to turn to our first uh, uh, person on the uh, on this. You know, I was not going to extend this forever war, and I was not extending a forever exit, uh, was I think one of the most interesting remarks uh, that I've ever, ever read on the subject. But uh, Madeline, over to you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, President Biden, in that speech justifying his exit from Afghanistan, also promised that American missions from now on would have clear, achievable goals, focused on national security issues, and would not rest, forgive, or forget terrorist threats against America and its allies. The question we're looking at today is, have those promises been met in NATO's response to not a terrorist attack, but a state-on-state -state attack by Russia against Ukraine that potentially also threatens NATO states? In Europe, the long wars and state-on-state -state attacks that had been, meaning that a state disappeared between 1861 and 1945 on average every three years, largely ended after 1945. From then onwards, new institutions were created with new norms and standards. The UN Charter created a norm against one state taking on another's territory by force. Civil wars and colour revolutions against kleptocrats theft of vast amounts of state wealth and the use of security forces to oppress peoples living often in dire poverty increased. Invasions and interventions to support or deposed tyrants and terrorists brought huge costs, loss of life, political consequences, short wars with long tailbacks of insurgent fighting. We're now living with increased hybrid threats against states, including cyber attacks, political infiltration and interference in elections, and major disinformation campaigns seeking to grow distrust in our states. We live in a constant sub-threshold state-on-state war, unclear, unfocused, willing to forgive and forget when the threat level moves from a phony war of Putin's 2007 Munich Security Conference speech to a cyber attack on Ukraine, sorry, cyber attack on Estonia, the invasion of Georgia in 2008, and again Ukraine in 2014. For some allies, hands-off engagements in today's state-on-state -state war in Ukraine, it's not just a lack of clarity as to who will be Britain's Prime Minister, it's how will our tough, forgiving, targeted, precise NATO alliance states react to high energy, fuel and food prices, migrant movements, or health service pressures, and how will they affect supporting Ukraine with dwindling stockpiles of munitions and equipment? Do we really have a clear and achievable set of goals if new conflicts, famine and crisis emerge in the MENA, or even in the Pacific? We don't know if the Russian people will bear the cost of loss of its sons or be willing to pay the cost in blood and treasure of an ongoing insurgency in an occupied Ukraine. We don't know if Putin will, in desperation, turn to chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear weapons. And we don't know if NATO allies will abandon another country and call for a negotiated settlement out of fear of those threats or of destabilizing Russia. Do we have a clear mission with achievable goals? Putin's major failure was in bringing regime change by his attack on Kiev. 
though at a huge cost to both sides, he has made gains in Donbass and Luhansk. But, and it's the big political but, the electoral clock is ticking, not just for all of NATO's leaders, but also for Putin, who must seek re-election as president in 2024. He needs success and a short war, as do NATO allies. We know that badly resolved short or long-term conflicts with poor peace settlements can bring down governments, but they can also reignite and have long-term consequence. So I look forward to today's panel discussions and your questions. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Madeline. Jeremy, over to you. <clears throat> Thank you. I'll do my best to keep to the time and I'll try not to re-say things that Madeline has said and rather more to leave some questions in the air. Let me say first of all that my personal view is that short wars are in fact rather uncommon uh, and only successful uh, when uh, there is a clear single point of issue, when at least one of the participants in the war has the power and capability uh, of actually winning the war, when the result is accepted by both sides, and when that war is not extended to uh, issues other than the original issue. Otherwise, uh, the sorts of things which we tend to regard as short wars are, in my own view, more like battles during a long war. Now, long wars are different, uh, and I'm going to suggest to you uh, that long wars are in fact a little bit more like relationships. Uh, if you consider, for example, the uh, wars between France and uh, England, Britain, uh, which ran from the 14th century uh, till either the 19th century, or maybe until the 21st century, depending on your view, uh, you will see that the nature of that war changed regularly during the course of it. It changed from uh, being violent uh, war to cooperation at times, but it was still a long running war in which there were smaller wars, uh, which were chapters in this longer war. The difficulty about a long war, of course, is that goals shift as the relationship shifts during the course of it, uh, and the points at issue can change. Indeed, they can actually become a prison, uh, too important to lose and too difficult uh, to win. So, as I say, it's a little bit like a relationship and it needs to be managed. Now, it's complicated, uh, to my mind, in this day and age, uh, by the global nature of uh, our economy and uh, our political world. We can export problems to nations uh, which have nothing to do with the war uh, as a result of even having the war in the first place. We can extend it, in fact, to all of mankind if we're not very careful, and with a potentially extraordinary consequences uh, for the future of the planet and the future of the human race. The difficulty about this kind of war, and the long war, is it sort of uses a range of means, military means, obviously, sponsored terrorism, psychological and ideological means, which Manley mentioned, trade and economic uh, weapons, internal subversion, uh, cyber warfare, sponsored migration, I'm going to use a phrase which I, I hope is reasonably clear, but the deliberate uh, attempt to shift populations as a weapon as well. Uh, consequently, at times, people are not aware uh, that there is in fact a war going on, uh, because they don't understand what the long-term strategy of the parties involved is. And these long wars are a terrific drain on resources. They're a drain on manpower, uh, they're a drain on industry, they're a drain on support, uh, they're a drain on the reconstruction of damaged um, uh, buildings and so forth, uh, and they're extremely hard to end. But I think it's important that we also remember uh, that the war is a matter of choice. I suspect, and I think uh, this perhaps contradicts something that uh, Madeline said, I suspect that we very, very rarely do any kind of cost-benefit analysis when we enter upon a war. Consequently, since we also don't know what kind of end state we want, 
we don't know when we should enter it or when we should disengage from it. And this is a very controversial thing to say, I know, uh, and would be roundly condemned by quite a number of our political leaders. But I think it's important that we understand that history tells us what happened. Sometimes it tells us why, sometimes it tells us lessons to be learned, but it doesn't tell us what's going to happen. And that is a matter of choice. Fantastic, thank you. Jasper, um, I think it was in your first, the air affair that you raised the Crimean War, I may be wrong, um, but that was back in, I think, 2009, and you postulated that the Crimean War would still be continuing. Well, that's 168 years ago. But what are your insights? Um, yeah, my, my primary insight is, you know, sort of quite what I'm, what I'm, doing on this panel, you know, rubbing e shoulders with people of vast knowledge. I, I'm a writer and I'm, I'm interested in ideas and speculative ideas. Um, and writing is kind of important because the, the ideas that, that, that we have, that we put on our books and everything are seed, seed people with ideas for them later on, um, which I think is kind of very important. Um, but it allows us fiction to be very speculative and have very, very different ideas and approaches, which are very much more left field. My view of uh, looking at forever wars is that essentially mankind is continually at war. I, I used to think that the the first and first and second world wars were simply the, a a um, civil war, European civil war. But then when you start looking at it and you think, well, OK, uh, well, they could go back a lot further than uh, the First World War and they could actually go a lot faster than 1945, because you could just say that the Cold War was a continuation of the of a civilian European war. But if you kind of say that, then you say, well, everyone is at war somewhere. So mankind is essentially at war with itself at all times and have been forever. And I think it's only the idea of, of war as um, uh, as we know it today, rather than simply having, you know, fights with the village next door, is that since since uh, small city states became nation states and could actually then uh, kill each other on a sort of far more industrialized, uh, uh, industrialized scale that it's become what we we know at the moment. I mean, I would just speculate this is we are continually at war. Humans are continually at war with one another. And uh, I was watching toddlers pushing over one another in a playgroup the other day, um, simply because someone had taken a, a, a little block that belonged to someone else. Literally, the first thing to do was to to use aggression um, in order to uh, to to get what they wanted. Um, and that's kind of worrying. I mean, I'd also like to throw in that um, that violence, um, even if you get away from from uh, war violence, violence is is a very male dominated. And, and this is kind of people sort of argue about this quite a lot. Male is a very um, violence uh, should be gendered um, verbs, they're, they're nouns, but they're not, and they should be. Most people who do murders are men. Most victims of uh, murders are also men. Most people that kill themselves are also men. Male seems to be an extremely aggressive gender for reasons that may have been very, very useful um, uh, thousands, if not you know, tens of thousands of years ago, but clearly now uh, just sort of setting, setting the world alight with continuous, continuous uh, problems and issues. Um, the, the, I'll just start with those opening remarks, but um, I'm coming not from a sort of historical aspect, but a sort of broad, slightly left field viewpoints. And none of those things I think I've said uh, are things that are new, uh, but I think they're well worth um, saying again now. Well, yes, an enduring story. Um, well, we, we thought just to liven things up a little bit, we'd have a quick poll of the audience. Uh, and so the poll is asking you out there, uh, why do you think some wars become long wars? Uh, is it because leaders are trapped in their own beliefs because of the sunk cost fallacy that, well, we've, we've, all this is we, we've invested or, or invest is probably the wrong word, uh, we're so deep in this. Uh, that they don't want to admit their mistakes. Is it uh, nationalism comes to the fore or that uh, there's a bit of a discontinuity in understanding? Um, as ever with a, a city forum and Zian uh, crowd, uh, people are very quick on their opinions. 
over half the audience have voted. We'll just give it a few seconds more to get more votes in, getting up to three quarter mark, uh, getting on up to about 80%. And uh, we'll just uh, have a quick look at the results then, which quite interestingly is that leaders get trapped by their own beliefs is at the four uh, sunk costs. Once you're in, you're kind of stuck, a little incentive to admit mistakes. Nationalism surprisingly low down, I think, um, as are you know people at the top not quite understanding what's going on, but trapped by their own beliefs and some costs and incentives to admit mistakes. Now we've structured uh, our discussion here around three questions, and uh, the first one is uh, very much uh, to get a bit of a, a discussion going around the question of does the evidence really show conflicts getting longer or shorter? Now, um, I, I composed the text uh, for the calling notice, and uh, that, that uh, was one thing where on the right, where I was looking at, if you look at these things, the Reconquista, 774 years. We've all read the history books on the Roman Persian. Jeremy mentioned the Hundred Years' War, which looks like a, you know, a, a short little conflict compared with some of these big ones here. Uh, but over on the other side, uh, it, it's a quote that, uh, uh, came actually out of The Economist, uh, claiming that the typical war is short, uh, the medium duration of war is being just over three months, uh, according to Paul Post of the University of Chicago. So we certainly have a conflict there. Uh, for my part, I, I think one of the distinctions is, is actually the, the nature of the war being internal or external. You know, is there a specific objective in a state-on-state -state war, as opposed to uh, some of these longer conflicts, which are really about trying to change minds or change allegiances. But I would welcome comments um, from, from the three of you. Uh, perhaps, Jeremy, you might go, because I think you've probably got the evidence uh, or some version of the evidence in mind. Um, thank you. Um, well, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that I agree. Uh, and, uh, incidentally, I didn't talk about 100 years war. I talked about a 500-year war with the French. Um, but uh, the, the, uh, I, I don't see any evidence that wars are, are getting shorter, but that's because of the way that I've defined it, I think. Uh, I see a war now uh, in the way that I described as a relationship, rather, uh, which uh, covers a range of issues over a long period of time, which nobody knows quite how to solve. Uh, the short wars quoted here are both ones that had quite limited aims. Um, Although you could argue that the uh, topping the government in Iraq hasn't done very much uh, to bring peace to that area, uh, if that indeed was the objective. Uh, I, I don't think there's any evidence that conflicts uh, are getting shorter, and I don't think there's any evidence that they're getting longer. I think that they always have been long. It's just that the nature of the war uh, changes during the course of that. Indeed, uh, if you think the uh, war with Russia may have been going on for a century or more, uh, of course, during a part of that war, we were in alliance with Russia in a different war. Uh, and then when that ended, we came back into uh, the uh, existing uh, standoff with Russia. So I don't think the evidence is that conflicts are getting longer or shorter. I think they've always, on the whole, tended to be long, not least because of the difficulty of escaping from a long war. And I'm guessing, Jasper, you'd be quite in agreement with that. Is that fair? Oh, yes, totally. Um, yeah, I mean, we seem to, I mean, proxy wars, absolutely what uh, um, what Jeremy was saying. I mean, proxy wars, we seem to slip from one one way in which uh, we're having a war to another. I mean, there's a, there's a big sort of other huge sort of, you know, conflict going on in the Middle East, which again, the huge uh, pro proxy wars which are being fought, but essentially, uh, you know, between uh, between um, um, Iran and, um, and Saudi Arabia. With, with lots of little proxy things going on. So I think, yeah, definition is is absolutely key here. And perhaps if we defined wars as being continually going on uh, between, you know, two, um, two very large um, um, powers, uh, it might be actually a great deal, uh, a great deal of, uh, of, of more help. But some um, economics, of course, come into warfare as much as anything else. And you could, one could argue that the Cold War ended because of an economic, uh, ultimately an economic failure um, of, of, of the um, then USSR. Um, and perhaps this is what is going on right now, is that it's, it's an economic war to try and bring uh, Putin's uh, regime to its knees, but with the, with the huge amounts of global embargoes. Um, will that take a long time? Will it not? I, I don't know. It depends how much money that um, um, we can pour into it. 
Mm -hmm. yeah, listening with you and Jeremy reminds me of a book by Stephen Clark. It's a kind of deliciously witty, um, but actually rather serious uh, history book, a, a Thousand Years of Annoying the French, <laughs> which is a, which is an intriguing book. Uh, Madeline, your thoughts on, on this? Is it, do you find any evidence, or is it a definitional issue? It's interesting, actually. I was, I was listening to Jeremy very closely because it's that interplay between the military and the politicians that's often at the cause of the problems that we've got. Because if, if you remember, what happens is politicians debate and decide, are we going to actually engage in war? And often there can be justifications that the military can put forward as to how we can achieve success and we can achieve it quickly. Politicians want sometimes to answer very simple questions in Libya, for example, where we were asked, um, are we going to let Gaddafi massacre people in a city? And you ask, do we have an exit strategy? And governments will say, yes, we've got an exit strategy. But actually, once you start a war, it's very difficult to get out. But also, when do you declare victory? I mean, we heard the state, you know, job done. We've been successful. We've toppled a regime. But toppling a regime is just the start, especially whether you stay, as we did in Afghanistan and Iraq, or whether we leave, as we did in Libya. We leave other people to pick up the long term consequences. And you can have periods of low consequences, of low tensions. But the tensions remain, they reignite. And sometimes they go back centuries, you know, Britain drawing lands in sand to divide up countries and to create countries. It isn't just the war fighting, it's how we leave the war fighting. And it's the peace that is negotiated. I mean, some people would argue that the Crimean War, when it ended, created a whole new set of problems because of the uh, the loans that the West, particularly Britain and France, gave to the Ottoman Empire that ultimately led to its bankruptcy and collapsed. So it's not just that military kinetic fighting stops, it's the long-term consequences and desires and political aspirations of nation states and politicians that decide whether something reignites. And I'm just accepting politicians, not just the military, have a, a role to play in both starting, ending and continuing wars. Thank you. Well, Sliding along a bit, we, we, we're going to just touch on your thoughts on the characteristics of long wars versus short wars, but the audience is uh, very alert and awake, and I think there's some pertinent comments for this one. Uh, Colin Coulson Thomas is curious about your thoughts. Are democracies inherently at a disadvantage in long wars, particularly long wars involving authoritarian regimes as the, as the opponent? Um, and uh, Robin Derbyshire is curious. What is the impact of outsiders on the length of wars? Uh, in some cases, measures such as blockades cannot be applied as quickly or strictly as possible because of the impact of outsiders is one example he gives. Um, but again, over to you, uh, let me just shake it up a little bit. Uh, Jasper, perhaps you'd like to lead on any thoughts on characteristics of long wars versus short wars. Uh, and I noticed in this war, we, we've been seeing uh, women involved, uh, you know, ballerinas, for example, uh, at the front line. So maybe it's not all male any longer. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, Putin is is unmistakably male and everyone I see around him is unmistakably male. Um, uh, yeah, democracy at a disadvantage. I, I think that's a, a really good, a really good point. I mean, uh, the, the interwar period and the appeasement, you know, this is very interesting. Uh, uh, part of uh, sort of history you know what what do you do a, a despot can actually someone who is has uh, all you know autocratic you know regime 
can can just make things happen instantly. But if you're in a democracy, of course, you can't do that. You actually have to talk these things through. And it's um, a, a revisit of what was happening, you know, um, in the in the interwar period is is, is very interesting. Um, I think it actually eventually sort of slightly played into the hands of the British is because we had to play catch up uh, very, very quickly in, in the late 30s and came up with a, a weapon of a weapon of war, um, of the Spitfire, which was essentially a late 40s um, technology uh, that was then doing battle with late 30s technology, with, which is what Nazi Germany had to offer. So there was a, there was a sense there that actually that actually helped um, certainly Britain, not not Europe as a whole, um, to defend itself in the Battle of Britain. So there's all sorts of strange things that come around with that. But yeah, I mean, I would definitely definitely say that democracy is at a, a, a disadvantage. But um, but I think also that having seen the global reaction to the invasion of of Ukraine has been very very interesting and very very speedy. And uh, we're seeing a lot of things going on behind the scenes, and especially with with embargoes um, to try and bring economically, as it's become an economic war. I think the U Ukraine is fighting a war on the ground with shells and bullets and you know horrible weapons of destruction. Yet the, the world behind is 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 fighting an economic war uh, against um, Putin, um, and you know obviously a financial war about how we can we can support um, Ukraine and what they're doing. There's there's two separate things going on there but yeah absolutely democracy at a disadvantage but it seems to have actually worked i think in certainly for uh, ukraine's advantage um, in this particular instance jeremy any thoughts on the characteristics uh, yeah i mean i've already given a view on the uh, characteristics of long wars versus short wars are um but uh, i would like to su suggest that one of the features of a long war is that it may well be independent of who the uh, leaders of a particular country, a particular country at a particular time. I mean, do we, for example, really believe that if we were to overthrow Putin, uh, the issues that lie between Russia and the West would suddenly disappear? Um, or do we believe that they would simply be picked up and carried on by another Russian leader, as it had been for the last um, several uh, decades? Um, so I think we need to look more deeply for the um, causes of longer wars and, and what the uh, dynamics of those are. And because I can't see where else to get this in, um, I wanted also to say that I think we need to understand, even in a long war, and even in a long war with as distasteful a regime as the Russian regime, we need to understand at least some of their own concerns. For example, um, uh, I believe that for a Russian, that Crimea is a vital national interest. I do not believe that there is any Russian government that would ever concede Crimea. Um, and um, I also believe, by the way, that if we were in a similar position strategically, uh, that Russia is in Crimea, where, where it wasn't uh, for a long time its only ice free access to the sea, we would feel the same. Um, so there are some issues which are uh, independent of either the political leaders, or maybe at the time, or even maybe the political ideology at the time because they touch the vital interests of the nation uh, as a whole. And those issues underlie long wars, and to my mind are independent of shorter term political changes. Uh, Gary glennon uh, is slightly optimistic. He says the diversity associated with democracy is ultimately an advantage. He, he thinks it will work uh, for Ukraine. Um, Yusuf Samayula has a very interesting point that optimism bias seems to be a universal thread with invaders or aggressors. And he refers to that famous marker in the Khyber Pass that records the passage of Alexander, Genghis Khan, the British, the Russians, none of whom did well in subduing path and tribesmen and women for very long. Uh, Madeline, over to you. I mean, is optimism bias a bit of an issue here? And you were referring, of course, to Putin's electoral clock uh, at 2024. Well, the big thing about this is that this is a narrative war and winning the narrative is also going to be critical. Now, we talked about the uh, the, the ease of which um, making decisions can be in an autocracy, but in an autocracy, you also control the message. So the public don't really know what's going on. On the other hand, the opponent is Zelensky. 
who is the most media savvy leader I think we have seen in generations. All of his cabinet, many of them worked in the media. They were journalists, they were writers, they were actors. So the narrative that he has been absolutely spot on in pressing of gallant Ukraine, while not heard in Russia, is having an impact wider and certainly getting across the NATO alliance a public engagement. But we also have underneath that a role of civilians that has completely changed. If nothing else, the civilian hacktivist movement is fighting a different war, both being able to identify those soldiers who have been uh, involved in stealing and looting in Ukraine, identifying the soldiers who've been involved in some of the massacres of civilians, naming and shaming and collecting information. So a new form of warfare is emerging here. It is more difficult if you're in an alliance keeping 30 people together, but it also means that you have challenges all the time to your thinking and challenge can sometimes be difficult to deal with but it can also be highly constructive the problem for the nato alliance is who do we place replace the secretary general with that's when the alliance is going to face its greatest problem i think is replacing gens i, I we have been so fortunate in having him Wow. what happens next is our big problem yeah it's this this concept of narrative is is really interesting i i i once heard somebody refer to this as a bit of a cartoon war I, i'm not being derogatory but the idea you've got this uh zelensky in his bunker with you know three days of stubble and t-shirts and you know brave fighters you know it, it almost fits the 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 star wars narrative of the dark star empire and then the, the brave freedom fighters and of course, the problem in that conversation was pointing out that you know there's very few conflicts where both sides aren't up to no good. And uh, what what would the public reaction be uh, if and when they discover uh, some U Ukrainian atrocities as well? And you know where would support linger and waver there? But um, just a quick one. We've got a couple of big themes emerging from the audience, but I, I wouldn't mind your quick thoughts on you know will this war be long or short and maybe a sub question to that which is if this is a very long war whom does that favor does that favor russia or does that that, that favor uh, effectively ukraine supported by the west and i, I guess I, I might start if i may with uh, uh with with you jeremy well <clears throat> I, I obviously I hope it will be a, a, a short war. Although I re repeat what I said earlier on, that may just be a chapter in a long war. Um, my own view is that um, the price of a long war for Ukraine, which is likely to be a, a, an enormous casualty rate, uh, with the impact that has on uh, the um, uh, ethnic um, balance and the, the gender balance and all the other things that are important in a population, will be great. And the material damage to Ukraine will be so great that it will be extremely difficult, even with the, uh, the help of the uh, West and some sort of martial aid plan, will be extremely difficult to restore the Ukrainian economy in anything other than a very long time. On the other hand, if it is a, if, if it is a short war, on both sides, well, I would I thought need a respite at some point. Can can the Russians be trusted uh, to keep whatever agreement is made? And now, if, if I was Zelensky, I'd certainly uh, doubt it. Um, which is why I think that uh, this is a chapter in a much longer struggle, whose final purpose I'm afraid I'm not able myself to perceive. Uh, so my answer is I, I hope it will be short. Um, uh, I fear that it will be long. And whatever the military outcome of that long war is, the price for Ukraine will be very much greater than the price for Russia. Madeline, your thoughts? One of the things that um, I suppose I learned the most about when I was at the NATO Parliament was the determination of the former Soviet states to not 
go back and the mindset of those who lived under a Soviet state is something that if you've lived in the West, you can't understand. You can't understand the grip that your brain is under of not saying the wrong thing that can lose you and your family to end up in the gulag. So within the Alliance, you're gonna have a lot of states that are gonna say, we have to make sure that we are secure from Russia moving on from Ukraine to pick off other states, including NATO states. The maritime journey, you haven't mentioned, and I'd love to hear your view on that, because I think the maritime is going to be quite critical. We talk about Crimea, we talk about Luhansk and Donbass, but if we don't get a free navigation of the Black Sea back, then the consequences for Ukraine, for Romania, for NATO allies is going to be huge. So that maritime space is as important as the land space. And some of that is going to have to be addressed, whether it is in a peace settlement, a negotiation as to how we continue a land warfare, I don't know. But those are going to be the critical issues, I think. Thank you. And Jasper? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I sort of echo really what, what Jeremy was saying. Absolutely. I think this is a, if we define a war as really, you know, when everything's back to normal, <laughs> it's going to be a very, very long time indeed. Uh, and, and the points about we don't understand Russia or the people who did understand Russia and could see what was going on. One could argue maybe that the collapse of the Soviet Union was, was like, you know, a sort of, you know, the Treaty of Versailles almost. And, and a humiliated nation is is not a healthy um, hum, um, nation at all. Um, Ola Bulla, who's a, a very good um, writer, wrote a, a whole piece about um, Putin and the new Soviet, um, wanting to rebuild the Soviet in, in the, how he saw, you know, the Soviet in his youth. Um, and I think there are people who have understood this, and I think diplomats um, have understood this. And as we all know, you know, diplomacy is a skill that is meant to last for 50 years, whereas politicians have a very short term expectancy of really when they're going to be uh, re-elected into power. And the mismatch between the two is, I think, almost sort of precludes the, the, the thought that we could either deal with wars like this in the future or deal with this anytime, anytime soon, because short termism within po politicians will always would always trump a diplomatic efforts of people who understand these these issues much much better and can actually say no we really do need to understand what russia is all about if we can to figure out where we, we're going to go with this so uh, sadly i think this will be this one will run and run and even if it's not ukraine then it could be it could be somewhere else unfortunately well, we're going to turn now to uh, questions and comments from the audience and there's some very good ones here um uh, Kelly Berman makes a, a, a very considered submission here, which I just read to you, uh, that the scholar Baha Rumalili posits an interesting hypothesis regarding protracted conflicts, particularly mutually destructive ones such as Palestine and Israel. She suggests that the national identity narrative is so anchored to the idea of the hostile other that it can only make sense of itself in relation to that hostile other. Uh, it's a similar argument to the question of individual psychology, which asks why do victims remain in abusive relationships? So kind of back to your point, Jeremy, at the beginning. And it certainly does seem to make sense when viewed through an ontological security framework in, in which a country or government securitizes, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, uh, scrutinizes an, ex an external other as a threat. Uh, it becomes enmeshed in national identity, really. Uh, Douglas Andrews says the current struggle with Russia is in some ways a continuation of the Cold War, but was that inevitable? Could the West, the US, EU, NATO have dealt with Russia in the early 90s in a way which would have made the current Russia-Ukraine conflict unlikely? Um, so just a couple of points there from the audience if anybody wanted to kick in. Um, yeah, but uh, actually, answering a different question Michael just quickly responding to Madeline on the, the maritime thing I think she's spot on 
Um, the, the trouble is that, uh, that the Black Sea closed, the uh, uh, literal states there are effectively uh, landlocked countries. Mm. And the landlocked country's economy can only exist uh, at the pleasure of the surrounding nations. Uh, the problem is going to be how to square whatever we may want to do there with the Montreux uh, Convention, and that's going to be uh, a difficult thing. That's not, I, I know, an answer to the question uh, that you just posed, and I have nothing much to add to that, but it is it's an attempt to answer my Okay. Well, let me move on a bit, because there is a, there's a thread here that I think is worth exploring, and it's really got to do broadly with the uh, military-industrial complex. Uh, so Hugh Purser uh, refers us, of course, to John Keegan's uh, famous history of warfare, uh, quite similar to your statements, Jasper, uh, but the key point being nuclear, uh, the effects of war on limited and nuclear, in Keegan's opinion. Um, and then um, Nikki Holtzhausen is curious about war and industries, and Hugh Purser, again, sort of, how does the panel view the cause and effect role of the military-industrial complex? So any thoughts on, on that? Michael, I, I'd like to just say politicians have tried desperately to deal with the hostile other by codifying behaviour. So we've set up agencies like the United Nations to try and bring some codification and set up legislation about behaviours in wartime to try and, and stop the human behaviour and aggression being unlimited. Now, the military-industrial complex is, is sometimes a little bit of a, uh, a fantasy of politicians being constantly fed the concept of buy the new weapons. In some respects, politicians in the West since 1945 have been much more focused on building the state. And some in the NATO alliance have been massively criticized that they've taken a defense holiday. And that our defense holidays, while we've invested in education, in health, in pensions, in social benefits, have in fact increased the potential for war. And one of the, the problems that we're all facing in the West at the moment is politicians have been caught out with the lack of investment in simple things like munitions and stockpiling. It depends if you believe in deterrence. Strong defense deters aggression. That's the basis on which the West has held its, its stance within NATO. Are we going to change that stance? And that's, that's the big question that the West is facing. Is deterrence strong enough? And has deterrence been real enough to actually deter President Putin? The audience, the audience might react uh, a bit here. There's some interesting points about it, it, it. We have, I think, always, you know, believed in deterrence, mutually assured destruction. I think it was Eisenhower who pointed out the military industrial com com complex sort of thing. And, you know, we, we look at that structure. But Gary Glenn and Alty would point uh, that, in fact, we seem also to, I think, have believed a little bit in the changing nature of communications, that uh, the, the channels of were open and there was more peer-to-peer -peer comms. And yet we find both within China and within Russia a uh, very limited uh, and controlled communications area. So the, I think the West was relying on information and free speech in ways that uh, weren't really being pr promoted. Uh, and then we've also had, and Sean Taylor's pointing us to this, you know, we had a we had a very strong belief that sanctions would be very effective. Uh, and except for a, a one week bounce, the rubles are doing really quite fine. And Russia's getting about a 20% uplift in revenue is uh, Sean's estimate. Um, so maybe we were actually relying, taking a deterrence holiday, uh, but seeing deterrence is the main thing and counting as well on communications and sanctions. Jasper, you're a communicator. <laughs> it's, it has the nature of communications um, yeah. in any real way? No, I mean, it was, it was interesting. I, I, I wrote, a, I read, a, um, I read, read an article and it's interesting what you were saying because Eisenhower actually was giving a warning uh, when he was talking about the uh, industrial, uh, industrial complex. Um, but because if you if you have it, you'll use it. 
um, and the use it or lose it basis. And this was this was the article I was reading. The use it or lose it basis with the massive amount of military that the um, that the Americans possess was the engine of some of their um, shall we shall we say you know le less than smart um, maneuverings, military maneuverings around the world, that if you have this stuff, you're going to use it. Um, China have a, has a huge army at the moment. Uh, Russia, again, has a, a huge army. It's turned out to be sort of a little more than a uh, sort of more of a show army. And and the uh, military parades, that sort of, you know, fetishization of these big, big, you know, um, uh, arms and everything is, is, is extremely worrying. But also, I mean, the fact that, that that sort of Europe, as we were saying, has actually taken that holiday, as you say, has kind of almost sort of cut down on their. There's been endless, you know, spending reviews about keeping the the, the, the spending down on, on military. It's it's obviously that's going to reverse now, and I can see that the arms manufacturers and designers will be sort of rubbing their hands at the moment, thinking, well, this is great. This is going to be a, you know, this is going to be Christmas come early. But I think there was a sense of optimism. That I that I, I I I should sort of tentatively applaud, you know, amongst nations within the within within a Europe, um, which was obviously you know a false a false optimism, and I think there were certainly um, people uh, nations who were who were bordering Russia who were, who have been saying for a very long time now, um, look, no, you can't relax. This isn't good. You shouldn't do these deals, and unfortunately, they they seem to have come true but um yes i think they use it or lose it is, is a worry um you build big armies you're kind of going to use them mm. yeah michael harwood has a very long piece which will be sent to you but he's drawing on beatrice hauser's recent article western ideas of war in the russia ukraine conflict uh and he mm. points out that the, we've got to do a lot of things right which uh, have to integrate to 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 create deterrence but he ends with a, a question for the panel do those on the panel believe that 3% GDP on defense is but one example of our need to spend in many different areas is about right? Um, well, uh, the problem with a measure like that is it goes up and down with the economy as well. So it doesn't actually really um, necessarily tell you 3% 3, 3 of, the, of our economy uh, in uh, of our GDP in two years time might turn out to be less than 2.5% today. Uh, so I'm not sure that that's particularly helpful. Um, I think you need to start with a, a clear idea of what you want and then see uh, what you can afford and then adjust your behaviour in, in a course of what you can afford. But I would like to say a very quick word about deterrence, since it's my favourite subject and the thing I've written about most, um, which is that I think we became obsessed with nuclear deterrence. I think yeah. people started to think that a big bang was big defence. Um, uh, and, uh, of course, uh, the whole point of the original deterrence and the es deterrence escalation matter was that you should never get to that uh, point. Um, in fact, there's now some reason to believe that the nuclear, uh, the fact that we own nuclear weapons has actually deterred ourselves uh, from uh, how we set about behaving uh, in the Ukraine-Russian conflict. Uh, deterrence it needs a major re-examination, a really major re-examination. It will need uh, an expansion of conventional deterrence, uh, both in uh, military and other terms, and it will cost a lot of money. Uh, and I just don't know whether the stomach for that exists. If it doesn't, uh, then uh, I think we'll be in very poor shape uh, because uh, I still believe that people will hesitate long before using nuclear weapons. Uh, and if we haven't got a suitable underpinning to the deterrent, we're you know, lost conventionally as well. So this is a huge subject um, and a very important one, and, and we won't have time to go into it here. But, but I just wanted to put that marker down. Madeline, I can see you. Well, I, I think there's a fantasy about the Russian army having, the Russian military having been proved to be ineffective. We need to remember that Putin has largely used an army based on conscripts, ill-prepared, and hasn't used some of his critical weapons armaments that we thought he would be using. So please don't run away with the idea that Russia is, is not fit for purpose. It is more than fit for purpose, and we are naive if we believe that. The UK has constantly been cutting the size of our military. We have no capacity to defend ourselves. We have capacity to fight 
in an alliance. But one of the things that we have done is perhaps tended to think in terms of buying exquisite pieces of equipment that are going to be the big game changer. And one of the things that Ukraine has showed us, shown us is that actually we might need to also focus on more of low cost equipment, including uh, drones that can last perhaps a majority of seven days on the battlefield. It isn't a case, Jasper, of uh, use it or lose it. It's a case of um, more often we sell it. We don't keep weapons, we, we move them on. And the defence cuts that the UK has gone through has been, it's left our Navy as very badly equipped. And I, I do worry that what we need is an actual honest audit of our capability, where we have the capacity to fight and where we need to strengthen ourselves in conjunction, quite honestly, with the defence companies and with the critical national infrastructure companies, because war is no longer just fought by militaries. There are so many people, many of whom are going to be on this webinar, who are vital to success or failure in war fighting. And the one area that we have neglected in the UK is building up our civilian defence and our civilian engagement and our civilian resilience in war fighting. And if we don't tackle that, we're on hiding to nothing in any future conflict. We're coming uh, close to time. We've got a minute for each of you. And I just wanted to, to turn to Jasper. Uh, Jasper, I'm, I'm curious, uh, as I suspect the audience is just about the theme of your next book, but uh, Alex Murdoch asks you specifically, <laughs> does the way the information war is running have any relevance, you know, to Orwell's Ministry of Truth? Is this a 1984 situation where different truths, truths are being promoted? Um, and uh, you're, you're sort of yeah, close. I mean, then I'll turn to Madeline and Jeremy. Yeah, uh, I, I guess absolutely. I mean, the, the first, the first, um, uh, the first, uh, you know, the first death is always truth in any war. Um, it depends which side you're on, obviously. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just come back to that: use it or lose it. That was really about you know nations that do military adventuring around the globe. I don't think that was specifically us, or us, not us now. Perhaps us, you know, many many years ago. Um, interesting, you're talking about the three percent. I'll just like to briefly talk about that. 3% uh, of GDP. We're not thinking about at the moment, perhaps if we were spending that, I don't know, I'm not an economist, should we be spending an equal amount on attempting to stop this sort of thing happening in 20, 30 years time? You know, after the ashes of 1945, we had the Congress of The Hague, 1949, to try and get Europe together to stop having these wars. And the United Nations came about and we have Declaration of Human Rights. All these things came out of a you know massive global conflict, which we're trying to stop this sort of stuff happening in the future. We seem to have forgotten that. And I would say, yeah, I mean, we clearly have to spend a bit of money on military, but surely we should be spending a huge amount on diplomacy to stop this sort of stuff happening, to understand um, foreign nations and their issues and, and just try and nip the stuff in the bud. Okay. Uh, Madeline, over to you, but just a pointer that Robert Pay is kind of curious, what do you think Putin actually wants? Uh, Putin, like I suppose lots of uh, politicians, wants a legacy, I would suggest, mm -hmm. and his legacy has been about past glories, and retaking Ukraine was part of past glories. It should also be borne in mind that Ukraine was central to a lot of uh, Russia's military defence capability companies, and some of that is also what he wants back. Uh, diplomacy absolutely cut quite dramatically in the UK following the 2010 austerity measures that needs to be built up. We do have a problem worldwide with a lot of money that goes into defence that is badly spent and defence procurement. We keep trying to reform it, we do, do keep trying to get there. 
and it gets out of hand, that has to be tackled and we have to take it because money is going to get short. But honestly, Jasper, if you want to know how war is progressing, journalists aren't necessarily going to, uh, sorry, my, my, my roof repairers are just leaving, so that thumbs up was to my roof repairers. Uh, go on to the defence bloggers, look at the defence podcasts, look, read the defence writers, because there is greater honesty and brutal analysis there of what is happening than you will ever get from a journalist in the field because i i've yet to find anyone in the military who is desperate to go to war because they've been there and they know what it is well, let me then give the last word to jeremy the audience uh, nikki holtzhausen is worried about uh, spilling over to turkey due to the maritime issues uh, yusuf samayula uh, points out about the Chinese militarization of the, th at least three of their several islands in the South China Sea. So a uh, fear that this is going to spill. But Jeremy, uh, the last word is yours. Oh, <clears throat> thank you. Um, firstly, I agree with what um, Madeline had to say about exquisite equipment and um, uh, the need to have much more usable uh, stuff. Um, but uh, I, the thing, I think the thing I'd like to finish with is the point about honesty. I mean, it, it seems to me that there is a total lack of honesty, and I'm afraid within government as well, about what our military is capable of. Not only is there a lack of, there is there a lack of honesty, there's an ignorance and an unwillingness uh, to learn about it. And I think uh, the risk, therefore, of us overreaching ourselves is really quite serious. And um, I would like to, I think, as my final remark, say we actually need to be truthful to ourselves um, about how much we gave it, and we're not being so at the moment. Well, well um, just to, to close, if I may, one, this has been a fascinating discussion, uh, and my thanks to Mark Lee and the City Forum team for indulging this theme, and uh, my thanks to all three of the panelists. Uh, what, what do I take away? Well, I can't summarize something like this quickly, but I think uh, broadly, uh, and the idea here is, is very much about forever wars. Uh, these are going to continue. And Jasper's comments about it being, you know, uh, basically always, uh, always at war and uh, male-dominated. Madeline made some very interesting points, but certainly what I took away was the importance of the political and the military together. Uh, and I think uh, Jeremy's points about relationships are, are there. In fact, you know, for me. I think one of the biggest issues is wars where you're trying to change minds probably never end. Um, uh, where, where I think we also got to was a really a need to think about deterrence. You know, has there been a deterrence holiday in, in Madeline's terms and Jeremy's points about really needing to rethink it? Uh, and uh, particularly the, taken by the point about nuclear, that nuclear has deterred us more than it's uh, more than it may have helped. So uh, some very, very interesting thoughts today. I really appreciate the time and insights that everybody has had, and uh, I do wish that there were no forever wars, and that if it were ever possible to have the war that ends all wars, I would probably be the only one I would sign up for. But thank you very, very much uh, for your thoughts and comments, and we hope to have you back at another uh, City Forum discussion soon. Thank you very much.